You know, we would be glad to take some questions, or if you have some suggestions or advice on things that the Lieutenant Governor and I might be able to do to help renewable fuels, please uh, bring that up at this time. We've got, a, I guess, a few minutes to do that. Yep, you go ahead. Um, you, know, you stated your support for P10 and E15. Right. Uh, just to be clear, if a fuel tax increase bill came before you with a differential for E15 and B10, you would be supportive of that? Well, not only would I be supportive of it, I'd insist it had to be in there if they're going to get my signature. I made it clear now, we've got to have the property tax reduction first. If we get the property tax reduction, I'm willing to consider it, but it needs to have that differential to protect this industry. Thank you. So, okay, we have a question first, over here. I want to thank the governor and lieutenant governor for uh, coming out on this hazard this morning. Uh, well, we have a state trooper driving us, so we've got an advantage. <laughs> uh, Warren Pitcher, an investor in Lincoln Way Energy in Nevada. Uh, my question would be, with the recent uh, inauguration of our President Obama for a second term, do you see on the federal level some help in Washington, D.C. for uh, renewable fuels? Well, I hope so. I, I, I guess, uh, you know, he came from Illinois, and, and, and Illinois has been generally pretty supportive of us on renewable fuels. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I think, you know, we, we know we've got a big battle in the Congress uh, on this issue, and we know that big oil has a lot of money and a lot of clout. So we're, we've got a big battle. I, I also know that I think Senator Grassley and, and Senator Harkin both have been very much on our team, as has our congressional delegation. But let's face it, we're a relatively small state compared to uh, the clout of these big states like Texas and the East Coast and the West Coast. So we have a lot of work to do, and we all need to work together. We need to work on a bipartisan basis to protect uh, the progress we've made in renewable fuels, much of which happened actually during the Bush administration when Senator Grassley played a key role in it. But we need to maintain that momentum as we make, go through this transition. Yes. Uh, Douglas Brown, also an investor in Lincoln Way Energy and RAG. Uh, could you just tell us what the current state of fuel taxes are for regular versus E15 versus E85? Monty, do you have that? Um, we do. Well, I can say, you know, you know, if you go to a pump in Iowa, you know, basically. E10 sells for 13 cents a gallon less than uh, your regular gasoline. That's not true in a lot of other states. And that's because of the structure that we have in place in this state, which has been very helpful. Um, and so I can, I can tell you that, but in terms of, um, you know, so basically it always seems to stay about 13 cents a gallon less than a gasoline that doesn't have any ethanol in it. Um, in E85, of course, uh, we have the, one of the biggest fleets in the state, and we came in an E85 vehicle, by the way, the Lieutenant Governor and I, and I started that when I was governor before, and the state of Iowa has one of the biggest E85 fleets. And we're also interested in promoting blender pumps, and, and obviously we did pass legislation two years ago to try to put Iowa in the forefront on E15. The, the EPA has finally moved ahead with that, but. As you know, petroleum is fighting that every step of the way. Going to. <laughs> yes. Uh, Warren? Warren Bush from Wall Lake. Uh, one of the things you asked for was advice. Yes. I read in the paper Sunday that the Republican legislature wants to refund tax. I think that is an idiotic idea. Uh, I think that money that is in the Treasury can be used to do uh, a lot of things that you guys have been talking about doing and thinking about doing. I don't think sending $300 or whatever it is back to individual taxpayers is going to accomplish anything. I don't think the 
$600 that were sent back from the Fed, uh, federal government in the past really did much of anything, had any impact. And if the signature event of this legislature is going to be to do a state tax refund, uh, that's not much of a signature event in my mind. I don't think that's probably going to happen. And you've got to remember, you've got two houses of the legislature. Republicans control the House, the Democrats control the Senate. I, I doubt very much that the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee and the Senator, Senate, Senator Bolcom, uh, is going to be at all interested in moving that at all in the Senate. So I, I think you're going to, and, and one of the things that when, I, and I've been, you know, I've had a little experience of being governor with a legislature that was split before, and so the program I've put together, which focuses on property tracks relief and education reform, which really provides some teacher leadership and compensation system, we specifically designed a program that we thought could gain bipartisan support and that was focused enough to accomplish some significant things. And, the, and, and, and so, in the end of the day, that's where my focus is. Those are my priorities. I'm certainly willing to look at and consider the other options that legislators of, of the, in the House and the Senate have to offer. But at the end of the day, I think having a very clear, focused agenda, and I think those are things that are going to help grow the economy and make Iowa better more prosperous state and prepare our kids for the quality jobs of the future that we want. So, uh, you know, I, I guess my feeling is uh, um, there will be a lot of different proposals from a lot of different people, but remember, for anything to become law, it has to pass with the constitutional majority in the House and Senate, and it has to get the governor's signature. Mm -hmm. There has only been one veto override in the last 40 years in our state. And that was uh, when Vilsack vetoed an eminent domain bill. That was it. And there's not going to be a veto override. And so I think that, but I also am trying to be very understanding and very careful and not say, you know, so I've tried to be um, very nonpartisan in what I've had to say and not criticize different ideas. I was going to add one thing. <laughs> I just want to add to that, too. That's why it's so important to do the two-year budget and the five-year projected budget. These are initiatives that we've been working on for the last two years, really addressing concerns of not only the educators in that system, but with, with local governments. And in, by putting together a two-year budget and a five-year projected budget, we're able to demonstrate that this is permanent tax relief. This isn't a one-time fix. This is an ongoing permanent tax relief that the three main objectives is not only to backfill permanent, not shift to other classes of property, but that every single class of property sees a tax reduction. And in order to do that, you can't spend every dime that's in the, the, the ending balance. You need to have a significant balance so that you can fund your priorities that we believe will provide significant opportunities and economic growth for all Iowans moving forward. And we're able to demonstrate that by putting together a five-year budget that's based on very conservative revenue and expenditure growth, but we need a certain ending balance in order to meet the obligations of $170 million into education reform and a $400 million dollar for dollar reimbursement back to local government. So we appreciate your comments. Okay, we have a question here. Well, you asked for comments as well. Yep, I'm yep. Dan Matlick from Lincoln Way Energy. Yep. Uh, we do a lot of tours, especially from east, west coast. Uh, one of my suggestions, and I know we've talked about it a little bit, but overall, generally, people coming from the east and west coast have no idea about the feed part. I Absolutely. Think that's just a, if, if we could get that out there a lot better, I think we'd do our cause much, much better than just uh, talking about the fuel only. Exactly. I think you make a really good point. There's a lot of people who don't have, first of all, they don't even know where their food comes from. They have no clue. This is what's sad. We found that in this lean, finely textured beef thing. They had no clue. They were given lies and misinformation, and they just bought a tooth, you know, tooth and toenail, hook and sinker, you know. It's just crazy. We in the Midwest, at least, even in our part of the world, though, we have a lot of kids that, that don't maybe have enough knowledge of where food comes from. But, you know, you're exactly right. The more we can educate people about the byproduct and what a great thing that is for, uh, for the food industry, and the Iowa cattlemen understand it, and our beef numbers are going up and they're going down in Texas and Oklahoma, so we understand it. And this, we just got to do a better job of getting that information out 
But sometimes it's hard to get uh, some of the media to really focus and understand that. But the more information we can get out, accurate, good information, and, and, the, and like you say, the more we can get uh, visitors to come and see it, come and visit the farms, come and visit the uh, ethanol plants and see what's going on in the real world, I think that can go a long ways. So thanks for your suggestion. Thank you.